This is our fourth critical thinking presentation. This one's on circular reasoning, also known as begging the question, and the Tolman argument pyramid, or the Tolman model. So Tolman argued that uh, there are three aspects to any good argument, data, warrant, and claim. And these are terms that you've uh, if you're not familiar with, uh, are, are at least conceptually aware of, uh, at least in a different form. Uh, instead of calling it a claim, we could call it your thesis or your argument. Instead of calling it a warrant, we could call it your analysis or logic. And instead of data, we could just call it your evidence or your support. And the general idea that Tolman put forth is this. You have a whole lot of evidence, a whole lot of experience. You read, you know, a whole lot of pages of Macbeth. And then what you do is you analyze those pages uh, or analyze that data and boil it down to a few key steps and then finally that all reduces into a central argument or claim and that's why it's in this pyramid format. And the reason why I'm uh, talking about this uh, Tolman argument pyramid is because it allows us to distinguish between the facts that we have and the way we're organizing those facts and that allows us to distinguish at what stage fallacies occur. So fallacies are errors in reasoning or logic, and we're going to talk a lot about fallacies in the next few presentations. We're going to be going over uh, more than 20 of them. And they are all instances where the facts that you have are correct, but the way that you are using those facts are incorrect. And I want to repeat that again. Uh, the data that you have is correct. Um, your understanding of the evidence is all right, but the way you're putting those facts together is not quite right into how it leads to your conclusion, your claim. This will be a question on the test. All right, so we've already discussed them a little bit, but just to solidify it more concretely, uh, the conclusion is what you're trying to prove, and a premise is the claim you use to prove the conclusion. It's your reasoning and your evidence. And so um, when I put something in the format that we've been talking about so far, what's called standard form, these are the premises and then these are the conclusions. So when you list the reasons and evidence with the conclusion below it, it's called presenting the argument in standard form. And of course, we usually use standard form with the deductive arguments. So here's a good example with premises and a conclusion. Premise one, all dogs are related to wolves. Premise two, Bob is a dog. Therefore, Bob is related to a wolf. What type of argument is this, inductive or deductive? It's deductive. Okay. So circular reasoning, that's what we're here to talk about today mostly. Circular reasoning, or, no, or also called as beg begging the question, uh, is when your conclusion doesn't prove anything new because the premises already assume it is true. In other words, your premises, or one of your premises, are every bit as controversial as the conclusion you are advocating. And the reason why I suddenly went to slow motion is because it's a difficult concept for a lot of us to grasp, um, and it's still something that even the most skilled logicians argue about sometimes. When does it count as circular reasoning? So just to emphasize one more time, it essentially means that you haven't gone anything anywhere new. Uh, you're spinning your wheels in the mud a little bit. Um, your, one of your premises basically needs to be proved first. All right. It's easier to show through examples, so, um, which we'll do in a moment. But about the terminology of begging the question, and honestly this is my own pet peeve, but a very common mistake is to say something begs the question when they mean it raises the question. I have seen this so many times. I have seen it in professional documentaries. I've heard professors say it. I've seen it. I've read it in the New York Times. People say uh, something to the effect of, last week's terrorist attack begs the question, are we really safe? No, it does not beg the question, are we really safe? It raises the question, are we really safe? The phrase to beg the question refers to an unknown or lesser known uh, version of the verb to beg, uh, which means to ignore or pass over. So when you say that it begs the question, you're saying that it ignores the question or it passes over the question. And so circular reason is begging the question because you're essentially assuming the conclusion that you're already trying to prove. You're not really going anywhere new. You're ignoring the central question. You're passing over it. And so just one more time, um, when you say it begs the question, you mean that it's circular reasoning. And when most people say begs the question, they really mean it raises the question. Um, okay. 
So let's take a look at this. Circular reasoning example. You should exercise because it's good for you. Why is this circular? Take a moment to think about it. It basically says you should exercise because you should exercise. Okay. Um, it doesn't really tell us much new. Um, and notice how I say it basically says that. I mean, it doesn't actually say that. It says that it's good for you as in it would be like it's, it's beneficial for you and you should do things that are beneficial. But really, that's not much of an argument. Like you should do things that, you know, you should do things that are beneficial to you. Um, I mean, really, it's hiding the explanation. The explanation is what about exercise does good things for you. Oh, well, it increases your lifespan because it strengthens your heart and does X, Y, and Z for other parts of your body. That would be uh, a better explanation. That would be a more fully hashed out argument uh, that, might that would support the claim that you should exercise. Um, but by, they basically haven't really said much new. And notice how I'm sort of emphasizing the word basically. They are kind of saying something new but not enough of it to really be worth uh, believing. And notice how um, in my explanation of why this was circular, the key thing that I'm emphasizing is what they're not saying. I mean, a lot of times in circular reasoning, when you're claiming, hey, that's begging the question, hey, that's circular reasoning, uh, you're accusing them of leaving out the most important thing that needs explaining. I'm going to say that again. You're accusing them of leaving out the most important thing that needs explaining. And here they're not really explaining what makes exercise worthwhile or healthy for us. I've heard this before. You can't give me a C. I'm an A student. It's very circular. The speaker is saying that they can't get a C because they aren't a person who gets Cs. They're not really explaining what about them exudes A-ness. What about their, them as a student deserves an A. Let's look at this next one. Take a moment to think about it. The Pope is infallible, therefore everything he says is true. Is this circular reasoning or not? Yes, it is. Uh, it's circular be, uh, because being infallible is the exact same thing as always being right. Um, whether or not you think that this claim is true and you buy into Catholic dogma is a separate question. However, an explanation for the Pope's infallibility, as in um, he has the you know knowledge of God or something like that, or you know, has some sort of special uh, relationship with God that gives him that infallibility, um, is, that would provide the explanation that we're looking for. Right. Is this circular or not? If I had money to open my business, I could use it to provide more services and ultimately make more money. It's not, actually. Even though it describes a cyclical process, it's, this reasoning is cyclical, it is not circular. Uh, oh, that should have said not circular. Uh, the water cycle isn't circular, after all. So it says, if I had money to open my business, I could use it to provide more services, and then those services would make me more money, and then that more money would allow me to provide more services, and then it's a cycle, but it doesn't mean it's circular um, in the same way, like I said here, that the water cycle isn't necessarily circular. Um, remember, when you're accusing someone of circular reasoning, you're accusing them of not proving the most important aspect that they need to prove. They are begging the question. They're skipping over the most important question that needs answering. All right, this is a harder one. You're going to want to really make sure you pause it and think about it long and hard. Premise one, if you have enough willpower, then you can quit smoking. Premise two, having enough willpower just requires a strong enough desire, which anyone can have. Conclusion, anyone can quit smoking. Is this circular? Yes. So it's circular because the premise assumes that anyone can quit because anyone can want to. But that's every bit as controversial as the conclusion. Let's go back to the big version. So having enough willpower just requires a strong enough desire, which anyone can have. They can? I don't know about that. I mean, I've seen a lot of people try and quit smoking, and their willpower often buckles. I mean, it seems like if you're going to deserve the conclusion anyone can quit smoking, you need to show how everybody has what is needed. But here you're just assuming that they have what is needed. Anyone can have a strong enough amount of willpower. And that's 
an open question. That's an unanswered question. Uh, that is a begged question that needs answering. Does everyone really have enough willpower? Um, I don't think so. Um, and so that's it's it's begging the question. It's circular. Uh, one of your premises is every bit as controversial as your conclu your conclusion. You haven't earned the right to the conclusion anyone can quit smoking. Let's look at another one. Uh, premise one: something can't come from nothing. Premise two: the Big Bang claims nothing preceded it. Preceded means came before it, so the Big Bang claims nothing came before it. Therefore, the Big Bang didn't occur. All right, pause it, take a second, think about it. Yes, this too is circular. You need to prove premise number one. Uh, something can't come from nothing um, is every bit as controversial as sort of the Big Bang didn't occur. Um, you need some arguments to back that up. Um, because if the Big Bang is going to be claiming to be the first big event in the history of our universe, um, then the argument that something can't come from nothing is essentially arguing that the Big Bang didn't occur. Um, you got to back this argument up, okay? You're baking the question once again. All right, so just to recap, uh, circular reasoning is very difficult. If, is, if it is the hardest fallacy for you, that makes sense to me. Uh, people all the time um, struggle with it. Um, and the test uh, on our fallacies is not, are not going to have particularly difficult circular reasoning examples. They won't be as difficult as some of the harder ones I just showed you. But you should know what I'm saying when I say that something is circular reasoning or that it is begging the question. I am saying that one of your premises are every bit as controversial as the conclusion that you are trying to prove. You haven't really gotten to the heart of the matter and, done, and really proved what you need to to deserve the conclusion you're trying to draw. Okay, on the, on the number five.